to sing. And heaven and earth to sing. He rules the world with truth and grace. And makes the nations free. The Lord reads of His righteous hands and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders of His love. Uh, okay, a little bit of mystery when you hear the next song start, please. <laughs>
right to make you see that. I didn't stand you up that time, by the way. You did that on your own. Sort of. It's okay. Oh, okay. It's okay. Perfect. Okay. Ah, fair time. Uh, of course, our updates, as always, pray for those who have not made a decision, or those who need to come back to the fold. Um, appreciate your prayers and thoughts this week. I'm going to pass it to my father. Um, It'll be a rough time for a while, but we thank you for your, your thoughts and prayers. Uh, Joe Streeling, Brandon Denison, and their families are first from Marty, Goldie Stark, <coughs> Sasha Kimmel for testing, Ron Ray for stress test last week, awaiting results, Alan Fleming for eye procedure, Julie Pippen Smalley, surgery this past week, Donna Pippen hospitalized this past week in Pittsburgh. Pete Zuto, Carl Payton's son-in-law with cancer, doing poorly. Hunter Stark, surgery this week on his feet. Martha McCray, asthmatic bronchitis. Glenn Thomas, five-year-old for health-related. Mike and Kristen Parchman, his son Jared, 18, was killed this past week in an auto crash on his way to Wednesday church service. Uh, Mike and his wife minister at Brooksville Christian Church in uh, Brooksville, Florida. Mary Sign, okay. Mary Sign family, and the passing of Mary's uh, father. Also, uh, Bill Hunt's mom, Karen Bell, broke her jaw and her left arm. Just buried Bill's dad last week, many of you may remember. Uh, my niece, Lindsay Ward, she's doing well in school and everything, and we're really happy, but she decided to. Uh, Stick her finger in the wrong part of the rowing machine, so mm -hmm. she has a broken finger. It was sort of accidental because her balance is not perfect. I don't know all the way on. And uh, my mother-in-law, Edith Cooper, for a procedure this week, and also Brother Bill Hunt was in the hospital with pneumonia this past week, so <laughs> he is doing a little better. So, just asking you to keep all those folks in your prayer. Prayer him this morning is a little town of Bethlehem, after which Brother Donnie Fogel will lead our hearts in prayer. <laughs> Also, that the parents are 
watchful and caring so that they detect no sign of further trouble. You know, the life of a Christian is much the same. We enter the water, are baptized. Come out of the water, a pure, spotless being. Once we leave the water, the sins of the world start to attack us and take us away from God. This is when our love and knowledge of God and His teachings will attain to keep us from harm. That's when our Christian friends are there to help us, just like the parents of that newborn. One of the teachings of God and follow weekly is a communion service where we take time to remember Jesus' sacrifice to free us from sin. We share in the bread of his body, the cup of his blood, as an antidote from sin, remembering Jesus took the sin of the whole world to the cross, dying for everyone to save us from hell. If we follow his teachings, just remember, like the new, like the new parents, he is watching us Let's do to come infected with the sin. Take this time to thank God for his watch care over us. Communion in the sanctuary. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the day you've given to us once again. My challenge, not only to myself, but to all of us here, is that we will take this Christmas spirit that we get around this time of the year. 
I hope it doesn't stop on Christmas, that it will continue throughout the year, that we can start to put our faith in you and use you as an example. We don't have to give the perfect gift. We don't have to give a whole bunch of gifts. You know, you have taught us how to love. And the greatest gift we can give anybody is to love them and to treat them with respect and honor. And it's my truly uh, prayer this coming time of the season that we do implement all these things. As we do gather around the table, though, we realize the importance of what we do and how we do it. We need to be in a prayerful mood, one we can commune with you, and one we can give reverence to. That's what this is all about. So as we go on through our time of this service, please let us realize the importance of it and that we implement it and we just start to live it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
father would come to you and say, in your house, and thank you for the many blessings you give us. The holiday season is upon us now. Many of us struggle to find the perfect gift. Well, let this congregation know the perfect gift that's already given and received in your son. You gave us hope. Let's give back to the many blessings that we, we receive ourselves with a joyful heart. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. <coughs> On the 18th of December, the twins turned 15. Donnie and Jamie's twins. Oh my God. That's something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and today they serve me. Uh, it's a big deal. It's a long way because we watched them back there going like this. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's the right way. <clears throat> a woman and an angel, a promise. And a song, a word to grant for any mind to hold. A tax long and a dream, a stable and some strong. He's tell the greatest story ever told. Sing in the highest, he is God, the Messiah, and bow before this awesome mystery. Mighty God, I have to thank you, you Lord, in the and it's still the greatest story ever told. A hillside and some shepherds, a blaze of blinding light. Angels singing carols in the cold. The glorious, greatest story ever told. Oh, sing the Lord in the highest. He is God, the Messiah. Come down before His awesome mystery. Come 
By the way, she's going to home read it for more. You know that? She's going to home read it for more. I know Miranda's fighting the battle as well. Not everybody's going home to be a fool. And so when I ask you this morning this question, this is not the most important question I can ask. The question is, do you want to go to heaven? Everybody does, right? The more important question is, are you ready to go to heaven? And the most important question is, do you know the perfect gift? Do you know Jesus Christ? Amen. We have a great fellowship here. This congregation is amazing. It's beautiful people. And if you just look at the fellowship that they experience when they come together, uh, you'll know that. I gotta look down in there and say, Amen. You see that picture of Aaron on there? That's a big Christian party. I'm gonna fit that. Maybe. We weren't going crazy. We just having a good time. They just had a great time. And the men had a great time this morning. I assume the ladies did as well in your Sunday school class. I don't know what you discussed this morning, so I don't know whether what I'm saying is going along with that, but we have. We're carrying on a series for the last, this is the second week now, on the theme of all things possible. We serve an amazing God, He's the awesome God, and with God, nothing is what, nothing is Him is possible. Right? We talked last week about in the creation, how He created out of nothing the heavens and earth that we now see. We referenced the worldwide flood, how God could literally take a planet. And tilled it 23 and a half degrees to where it is today, and literally create a worldwide tsunami with all the waters that were above the firmament and the waters of the ocean, and create a wave of, of destruction that is worldwide and destroy everything on the planet, yet at the same time deliver those who were in the ark. I can't do that, you can't do that. We cannot simultaneously create worldwide destruction and at the same time save for God's zeal. When you read the scripture, you know that. You know that with him nothing's impossible because of his providentially placing you where you are in a time such as this. You're in a perfect place where you were born, where you were raised, you're right where God wants you to be. And the question, as our small group study points out for tonight, the question is not, what is God's will for my life? The question really is, what is God's will for today? And his will for today is that we would follow the leading of his spirit and follow Jesus Christ. Quit worrying about 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. Simply do and ask God to lead you how he wants you to live today. And that'll take care of what comes down the road. Make sense? It does good to the folks. And so we were kind of covering some of those things. And one of the last things we talked about last week that we'll be spring for today on perfection is this thought where we talk about prophecy, Jesus fulfilling prophecy. Now, how many of you know the only people on the planet probably that can keep their job and be wrong half the time are weathermen? How many of you know that? And that's actually what they're trying to do. They're trying to predict the weather. They're trying to give you the conditions. But could we understand this one that when we read prophecy from the Bible, prophecy would be a statement given by a prophet of God with information from God about something that would take place in the future, years in advance. And the likelihood of those things coming true in this one man, Jesus Christ, is astounding. That he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be crucified. By the way, the prophecy that was made about his crucifixion was given about a thousand years before the Romans had ever invented crucifixion. It talks about his hands and his feet being pierced. And there's one, one prophecy in particular in the book of Zechariah. And let's see if I can find it in reference so you can you look up this sometime. This is this is amazing. And I believe it's from Zechariah chapter 11. So if you're taking notes today, Jot that down, or mentally think in your mind, book of Zechariah, and then think of bankruptcy. Chapter 11. In verses 11 through 13, there is a prophecy that basically, when you read it in the Old Testament, it almost goes word for word to what happened in the New Testament, where someone sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and when he tried to return the silver, the religious readers wouldn't accept it, so he threw it on the floor of the temple. And the religious leader took the money and bought uh, burial plots. And what's so, so amazing to me about this, this prophecy that would be fulfilled, is that the skeptics, the ones who scoff at our belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, their claim is that the Jews actually invented Jesus. They claim that the Jews, in conjunction with the Romans, invented a fictitious character known as Jesus Christ. 
and presented him as Messiah for the world. I, I'm going to ask you a question. Why would you purposely invent someone who's going to be a thorn in your side, like Jesus was with the religious Pharisees? Why would you invent someone who's eventually going to be exalted as Christ, the Son of God? And even to this day, where you know they don't want us to pray, they don't want us to say Merry Christmas, you know, all these things. Why would you do that? So to me, that's just amazing how that all dovetails together. And that's really the first point of our message today on Jesus being perfection, is that he precisely and perfectly fulfills every Old Testament prophecy, even one so that he would be born of a virgin, spoken 750 years before he would come from the tribe of Judah, and you put all those together, and as we said last week, one thing we said, if just eight of those prophecies would be being fulfilled, would be like taking, what was the number? I think it was 100 quadrillion silver dollars, and placing them on the, the landscape of the state of Texas. They say those silver dollars would be two feet deep. How many of you get excited about wading through two feet deep of silver dollars? Right? And then one of those silver dollars, you take a red magic marker and mark it with an X, and you just fly over the state of Texas, and somewhere over the state of Texas, toss out that one silver dollar to go with the rest, and it's somehow buried beneath it all. And then, in the center of the state of Texas, you take and place a blind man. I think Marvin would volunteer, don't you? I'll have to call him and see. We place Marvin in the middle of the state of Texas and let him walk at random for however long he wants to walk. And we tell him, out in this huge state of Texas, 800 miles by 800 miles wide, 800 miles wide, two feet deep in silver dollars, Marvin, out there somewhere in all that expanse is a silver dollar mark with a red X, and we want you to go out and find it. And if you can pick it up on the first draw, you get them all. What are the chances that he'd be able to do it? His chances are 1 in 100 quadrillion. And suppose he did, what would you say? It's amazing. The chances of Jesus fulfilling just eight of the prophecies are one in a hundred quadrillion. So I'm convinced from the prophecies being fulfilled in Christ, I'm convinced he's the Son of God. I would do. Actually, the Bible says the Bible says we would do well to pay attention to the prophetic word. Peter talks about that. So if you want to really pay attention to something about proving Jesus is the Christ, look at how he precisely and accurately and Completely fulfills every prophecy. And there's over, over 300 and some plus prophecies about Christ. Secondly, he is perfection because of the sinless example of his character. Take a look with me in your New Testament if you haven't with you this morning. I've marked it in my Bible for foundation of the word today from 1 Peter. 1 Peter. That's where we're going. 1 Peter chapter 2. The sinless example of his character. <laughs> we talked in Sunday school this morning. Does anybody know how many people on the planet have sinned? How many people on the planet have sinned? All of them! I know you got some obsessive compulsive disorder out there looking for an exact number. I didn't want an exact number, I just wanted that three letter word all. All have sinned, except one. All have sinned. Take a look here in 1 Peter chapter 2. Look up in verse 18 where he says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. But this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a man bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. What credit is there when you sin? Our hearts are treated to be patient. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose. How about we just read that verse together as a congregation? All right? I'm assuming most of us are translations are very similar here. Ready? For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So who's your point of reference? In regard to the Bible. It's not me, is it? Because I sin. 
All have sinned, Romans 3.23 says. All have sinned. That meaning at some point in our life we have sinned. And then when he goes on to say, and come short, it is a, it's a phrase that literally rendered, and we continue to sin. We continue to come short of the grace of God. Yet he goes on to say, we've been given a free gift, and we've been justified by Christ because the propitiation was made for us for our sins. Jesus is the perfect example. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 that he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. The devil didn't have to work that hard on me. How about you? After Jesus was baptized by John in Jordan, remember where he went into the wilderness to us to be tempted. And then throughout his ministry, Satan would continue to tempt Jesus through either the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life, as First John points out. First and second and third John. It talks about those three three vices that pull us down. Satan worked on Jesus for 33 years and never could get him to sin. And it only took the devil a few years to make. Once I came to the knowledge of understanding the good and evil, it didn't take long for him to break through my armor. How about you? And I have an idea before the day's out, we'll break through again. He'll try, won't he? So our example is Jesus, and that's really encouraging because this is the perfect gift given to us. This is perfection. And the perfect gift that we can give this year if it is to be described as a perfect gift, is a life lived for Jesus. Now a little commercial. A little sidelight. Something comes to mind. I'm learning this morning that a lot of the ladies out there like to give the perfect gifts and love to cook the perfect meals. Right? And you all know how much you love sauerkraut. Well, this past week, for the ladies' Christmas party, my wife made up some barbecue pork. I mean, this is to die for, you know what I'm saying? And I said, that's the God for you to use. The perfect meal you can make is what you just made, this barbecue pork. You make a batch for me, and then you can go do what you want, add all the sauerkraut, and the rest will do another one for you. <laughs> the meat, that is the perfect meal. You now we're going to have to go out and order pizza like we normally do on New Year's Day. Perfect gift you can give this year is not a gift under the tree, it's not a meal on the table. The perfect gift we give anyone is what a life lived for Jesus. Yes, I'll say it. If me eating a meal of sauerkraut would lead me to come to Christ, I'm good. But that should not be your motivation. Your motivation should be what? Jesus Christ. So he is perfection in regard to precisely fulfilling every prophetic utterance, proving him as Messiah. And as I said, the religious leaders really invented him as a fictitious character. Why would they do that? Because now he is exalted as Messiah. And one day, according to Philippians chapter 2, every knee will bow. Let's go to that third point. Let's talk about the third point of perfection with Jesus. It makes him different from anyone else. It is this. It's what the Bible calls atonement. A T O N E M E N T. I'm going to give you some words this morning. This is teaching. These are words we ought to have under our belt. But because of his atoning death, when he offered himself as a sacrifice, how many of you believe that Jesus died? And the whole world believes that they believe Jesus lived. Even those who don't believe he was the Son of God believe he died. But how many of you believe he died for your sins, according to the scripture? How many of you believe that he was also buried and on three days later rose back to life? How many of you believe that? That's what sets us apart. And that's why his death is so special. Unlike anyone else's death, Paul in Romans said, People will die for a good man. They might even Dare to die for somebody's not so good, but God demonstrates his love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verse 8. This is a, a death of atonement. It is a death that is another term that I can use is vicarious. Say vicarious if you would. Vicarious. It's a term, it's, it's not for the LDLs to speak into biblical terms. It is a death 
where the where Jesus Himself is, and that's what the word we had trouble pronouncing this morning. I still have to work on it. Try it with me, Ron. You ready? Propitiation. Ready? Propitiation. Those are at least three words that I have on the back of this sheet. I have atonement written, which simply means that our sins are forgiven, and it makes it possible that we can be reconciled to God. So if someone says, what is atonement? Atonement is where God makes it possible for our sins to be forgiven. And in his death, Jesus' death, it was what's called an atoning sacrifice. Because when he shed his blood, I mean, people have died shed their blood, right? If you cut yourself, you shed your blood. But if you die from it, that means, it just means you died from it. You may even save someone's life. Like that man in San Bernardino. I can't remember his name now, but I saw a Facebook post of him and how beautiful the tribute to his life was as he literally wrapped himself around the co-worker as the bullets were flying. And he simply said, I got you. I got you. Name's Shane. I remember that much. His first name is Shane. And when this young lady has a baby, they're going to read that baby Shane in the honor of his dad. And in a sense, you could say, he saved her. He saved her life. In a sense, you could, that's kind of like atonement. But atonement goes farther than that. Atonement just doesn't just save our life. Atonement forgives what? Forgives us. You can try to wash and scrub it off all you want. The soap, the water. But it has to be through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ that covers us when we are immersed in the hand of baptism. That's what Peter said. Baptism saves us. Not the washing away the filth of the flesh. You can't get rid of it that way. It's a surrender to his death and prayer of resurrection. The atonement they make. So you can be reconciled. That's another word. Reconciliation. What does that mean? Have you ever been angry with somebody? They weren't talking with you for a few days. Right? And it bothered you. So you wanted to have the relationship restored. So you went, you made amends, right? Well, they, were, they came and made amends. It's pretty forgiving. You want to be reconciled. That's what reconciliation is. To be able to have the relationship restored, to be back on friendly terms with God, okay? <clears throat> where you are no more an enemy. Remember where Jesus said, I don't call you slaves anymore. I call you what? I call you friends. What greater testimony can we have when people look at us? And it's not about status. It's not about brains and intellect. It's about they can look at us and say, hey, there goes a friend of God. Because God's friendly. So in the day of judgment, when we see Jesus face to face, what are those two words you want to hear at the beginning at least? Well done. Jesus looks at you and says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful a few things. I'll put you in charge of many. It's sure better than the alternative, isn't it? Whenever you do, you depart from me into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Rather to know because of atonement, because of reconciliation. We can be friends with God again. Just like it was in the Garden of Eden where they would go out for a walk with God and have a daily walk. It wasn't like that after sin. And because of that, eternal life that we receive, we receive something that's called redemption. Redemption. And that simply means that we regain something that we once had but was lost. Did you get that? Redemption. You had that close relationship with God? I did too. I was a little boy. If I'd have died as a baby, I'd go on the street in the arms of Jesus. But as soon as I became old enough to understand the difference between good and evil, and then I chose evil, that became sin to me. Then I was a sinner that I was separated from God. But now, because of redemption, I lost that close walk with God. I was an enemy of God. But when I receive redemption, I receive not only that which I once lost, but also the debt that I owe. Did anybody owe a debt this morning? I'm not talking about credit cards. <coughs> right? You don't owe a debt. You owe a debt that you can't pay, you can't afford to pay. You owe a debt that you can't pay, but somebody that didn't know it did pay. There's a song about that. That I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. And that's Jesus Christ. When he dies in our place. That's another word, by the way, that word vicarious that we used before. He dies in our place. It's a, I'm not joking when I say this. It was literally a gift exchange. The Bible says in Corinthians that he who knew no sin, that's the perfect sinless character, he who knew no sin, what did he do? He became sin for us. 
that we might become the righteousness of God. So if you're taking notes here, you put there the word sin. See, man, that's everything I had to offer him. This is a gift exchange. And you put over there over the right the word righteousness. That's everything he is. Sin is everything I am and everything he's not. And righteousness is everything he is and everything I'm not. And so when, death, when Jesus dies on the cross, here's what God was doing. He was giving a gift exchange. It does not very fair to me, does it to you? He takes his righteousness, which results in eternal life, and he says, here, I give this to you, and in return, we give him our sin. And that's what the Bible means when it says he bore our burdens on the cross. And he nailed it all to the cross. That doesn't sound like a fair gift exchange to me. I don't know about you. But then again, since he offers the gift, if I say no to it, no, I will not accept that. I'm too proud to accept it. I cannot accept that a God who never sinned would give his son and die for me. I'm not worth that. God says, well, I think you are. I think you're worth dying for. But I can still say no, can I? I can still say no. And if I do, I'll wind up in hell for it. But the gift has been given nonetheless, whether I accept it or not. And we joked this morning about gifts that really didn't bring much joy when we were kids. Like when you open a gift. Now, I never got excited about getting socks and underwear for Christmas. <laughs> never did. Now, I must be getting older. Cool. Because we don't have to do laundry every week. I can wait two weeks. I have some money to come up here. This point all that I'm going to get sidetracked. But the gift is still given in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, where He exchanges His righteousness for our sin. He becomes sin for us. He becomes ashamed. God turns His head, and all that stuff. So that we can be honored on the day of judgment and stand before him with great joy and blame. Do you look forward to that? I will encourage you to keep looking forward to perfection. All have sinned, come short. All go for Let me close by saying this the minutes that we have left. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. I want to go to a few scriptures with you this morning. It'll just be a few moments. I want you to just focus in on what's happening here. And while you're turning there, a story comes to mind I haven't thought of in years. I never thought it would come to me this now, but it has for a reason, I think. Back when my dad had cancer in 1987, long story short, we made a surprise visit to my parents' home in Canton, Ohio. We lived in Mississippi, drove 800 miles to visit my parents. They didn't know we were coming. We went over to our sister-in-law's, and her job was to call my mom and dad and basically convince them to come visit for a few moments on, I think it was Christmas Eve. Dad wasn't feeling very good. He had that cancer, you know, it's coming back. But Ann was able to bribe him. I was going to bribe the bribe people, but I'm glad she did. Dad loved butterscotch pie. And this is wrong to me. I love butterscotch pie because it really is always needed. Me, I'm really going to miss that. And I said, Why don't you come on over? I got some butterscotch pie. Really, she didn't, but it, you know, she wasn't together no time. By the time we were there, the, so they were there, the butterscotch pie was ready. He said, Okay. They didn't know we were there. They came in the house, we were hiding in the back room. And as my niece Debbie was hugging them, they could do, you know, the kind of kids all covered up with their hugs and kisses. We snuck out into the kitchen and we just stood up. And my dad was like, <laughs> and his first words were like, how did you get here? I said, we drove. <laughs> Listen, when we get to heaven, this verse teaches me. When people look at us, they're not going to be asking, how did you get here to heaven? I'll tell you how we get to heaven. We get there by focusing on perfection. It's not us that do. It's Jesus Christ. Look what happens here in Philippians 2. In verse 10, at the name of Jesus, what will every knee do? Every knee will bow. Go over to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. In verse 10. And 
in Revelation 19, verse 10. This is the Apostle John, and he's been listening to the voice of an angel. And this is what John says. I fell at his feet, referring to the angel. I fell at his feet to worship him. What would the angel say? Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours, your brethren, who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship who? Worship God. Let's look in Revelation 22, chapter 22. The last chapter of the Bible. In verse number 8. Revelation 22, 8. I, John, and one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the word of this book. Do what? Worship God. And then in, in the same book of Revelation, you see, the good thing about Revelation is go back to chapter 4. We're almost there. I'm about to bow before perfection today. <clears throat> but we're really not through. We're only just beginning. Beginning to understand all about him is perfection today. I don't care if you understand what the book of Revelation teaches. All that teaching out there is so wacky and off the wall. You may miss the heart of Revelation. I want to share with you this morning is the heart of Revelation is we bow before perfection. Revelation 4, verse 10. Revelation 4, 10. 24 elders, what did they do? <coughs> fell down before him who sits on the throne. And they will worship him who lives forever and ever. They'll cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord our God, to receive. Glory to God. And then in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, let's go to the next chapter. It's a recurring theme, a theme of praise, like we've experienced today in this number, this gathering. Revelation 5, 8, when he taken the book before the creatures, and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Who, who, before whom? Before the Lamb. Who's that? That's, that's Jesus. And then same chapter, verse 11, I looked, I heard. Many angels around the throne, living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads and myriads, and thousands and thousands say, Worthy is it, worthy is the Lamb. And then finally in chapter 7, verse 9. After these things, this is chapter 7, verse 9. I looked, now we've got a multitude which no one could count. I mean, when, 24 elders, the angels, the myriads of angels, there's a whole bunch of thousands, and now we've got there's so many you can't count them all. Every nation, all tribes, all peoples, tongues, stand where before the throne and before who? Before the Lamb. They're clothed in white robes. This is us. Palm branches in our hands are crying aloud, we're saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and around the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped. God saved. <laughs> Amen. Blessed wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, might be to who? To our God. Wherever. When the elders answered and said to me, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they? Where are they come? He said, Lord, you know. He said, These are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation. They wash the robes, they make them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's a totally. And for this reason, this is why, see, they accepted the gift. This is why they're before the throne of God. He's serving day and night in this temple. Do you see it? Do you see yourself there? They're worshiping him who sits on the throne. His tabernacle will go with them. They'll hunger no more. They'll thirst no more. Nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, who is that? Jesus. That's perfection. He's in the center of the throne. He'll be their shepherd. He'll guide them. The springs of water of life. God will wipe every tear from their Peter, fishing, the Lord says, cast your net on the other side. This is Luke 5, and Peter says, we've been fishing all night, God, I'm not a thing, but I'll do what you say. Let's say that, ready? I'll do what you say. It's Jesus speaking, and he says, I'll do what you say. He throws a net on the other side, remember what happened? He catch so many fish, he can't haul it in, the boats begin to sink. The Bible says Peter fell down and fell flat before Jesus to depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Folks, that's the first step to becoming Christ. That's repentance. 
Baptism is where we meet his death and his blood. The Bible tells me something happens when we're buried with Christ. We're not just up there in the water, are we? What happens after burial? The graves. They come up like I came up in the kitchen that day, and my dad said, How do you do? We, we raise when we stand in the presence of Jesus, and we stand now and we sing, decided to follow perfection. I have decided to follow perfection. Let's bring it back. We got there. We will get there. We are getting there. We are going there. We got to see what it is that he did. We are going there right now. All because Jesus. You know the, the stuff they put on the top of other back of mine? To me, it's good enough, but I, I, I like it all on the meringue. But, but in heaven, God gives us the meringue as well. And I love it because to me, the meringue, the added, it really didn't have to happen because the butter scots is the main thing. See, in Jesus, that's the main thing. But the meringue is we get to see our loved ones on the boards. Of all the things we worry about and fret about and fight about, people are important. I'm going to see Joe again. I don't know about others that are there. If we lose Miranda, he throws the Miranda on all those money goes. Stand and sing. Would you come today? Does that convince you? Do you need a better gift than that? The perfect gift that you get that the Lord prayed today. Are you like me? Thank you.
part of that, what you all the responsibility, all it is, is you'll come, set the tables up, put the chairs around them, and that's it. But our ladies, that's more than they we need to ask them to do. So gentlemen, you know, I'm asking you, uh, you know, you can stay, throw six chairs in on top of each other. They stack nice. We'll move them, get set up for our next bush time. All right. May I add one thing to that? Go on. You said chairs. Where's the dynamite? I'm not. you are stacking those chairs, make be sure that the legs are lined up for the second one. That way they won't tip. Yeah. Get up six times. They do kind of stack them. Pretty yeah. easy, but you better stack them right. Come on, show all over. Oh, dear Lord, it has been a great day to be in your house. To hear the word proclaimed, to hear the singing, and especially hear the prayers. I hope it was a sweet sound in your ears. I hope that we will leave this place and we will be honorable. We will do the things that you have asked us to do. I know a lot of people look at us as hypocrites because we don't do that, but it's my prayer that we will make a special effort, not only through this time of the year, but through all our years, you know, that we will glorify you and put you first and foremost in our thoughts and our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.